today, your electric launch is the decarbonization speedway study. This study comes in response to the ever-evolving energy transition. Changes in both the technological and geopolitical landscapes required a fresh, new look on possible speedways to decarbonize our European energy system. For example, in the last couple of dec decades, we quickly gained new insights into the possibilities of direct electrification, the position of and the dependency on natural gas, and possible applications of hydrogen. Even though that CO2 emission reductions were at the core of our analysis, it needs to be said that CO2 emission reduction is not the only goal. As was already mentioned this morning, a successful energy transition is also characterized by high standards in efficiency, reliability and affordability. We are gathered here at the Power Summit today with one purpose in mind. To discuss strategies and approaches on how we can accelerate progress towards our goals, because we all know that we need to take immediate action. We hope that the insights and findings from our study will serve as a foundation for these discussions, shaping the future of our energy sector. So acceleration, that's the key. How do we get to 2030 and beyond? Even though that emissions have already been steadily declining since 1990, it is clear from the graph behind me that we need to significantly ramp up our efforts to reach our targets. And not only that, we also need to realize a breaking point from the past trend, meaning that we do not only need to accelerate, but also do something different. In our study, we analyzed three different scenarios to better understand how we can accelerate progress towards our goals. We have split our methodology into two phases. In the first phase, we looked at energy demand. We looked at seven different energy carriers for the EU27 plus UK, spread out over five sectors and 12 corresponding subsectors. In the second phase, we used the results from our demand modeling and put them into the Maon electricity market model to look at what needs to happen on the electricity generation side. This is a linear optimization model and we took as many iterations as we needed to reach a system with minimal hours of loss of load and energy not served, because reliability is key. For this presentation, we will focus on the Repower EU scenario, which reflects the latest European policy plan. In this scenario, we see an acceleration in our efforts, particularly between now and 2030, prioritizing the low-hanging fruit. After that, we see a steady subsequent further decline in emissions until we reach our target. It's important to call out that we also need to maintain our momentum and dedication also in this period to reach our targets, because not only does this scenario reach an 80 to 90% emission reduction in 2040, it also goes without saying that the further you go to the right in this graph, the harder your decarbonization efforts become. So let's move into the role of direct electrification, as this was the main driver of decarbonization in our scenarios. And we all know why that's the case, right? Let's just quickly look at two examples. When you, for instance, replace an average natural gas boiler in a residential home with a full electric heat pump, total final energy demand for heating purposes goes down by 73%, corresponding to a 66% decline in CO2 emissions. And these results are very similar when you look at replacing a gasoline car by an electric vehicle. So there are two things that stand out when looking at the total results for direct electrification. First, 61% of total final energy demand will be electricity in 2050. That is an immense feat. The second thing that stands out, however, is the efficiency gain. Between now and 2050, total final energy demand will drop with 39%. This efficiency gain is a result of both technological advancements and fuel switching, because electricity is a very efficient way of using energy. And these results are even stronger when we zoom in on households, where direct electrification plays a big role, supported by other sustainable energy factors for heating purposes when direct electrification is not possible. And the result is remarkable. 
with a very substantial decline in total final energy demand. This implies that households could embrace sustainable practices while maintaining their lifestyle standards. As I said in the beginning, CO2 is the core of our analysis, but it is not the only objective. There are many more benefits to decarbonization as they are shown on the screen behind me. Accenture as a firm refers to this as 360 degrees of value, meaning that there are many more benefits beyond the primary objective. For example, our decarbonization efforts will save us 40 to 140 billion euros of annual spendings on health issues related to air quality. It will also save us 175 billions of euros on fossil fuel imports. And we all know that it's important to, crease, to decrease our dependency there. And these are just two examples, while well, you can see all the other benefits on the screen behind me. So how will we deliver these benefits? We need to get things done but we also need to get things right. We need to install the right generation capacity while maintaining reliability of supply. And we all know that this means that we cannot just shut down our fossil fuel fire power plants and replace them with renewable capacity overnight. The system requires enabling factors to keep the system working. In the next slides, I'm going to show you the results of our analysis. And remember, these results always look massive when we aggregate them on a European level. They might not seem as daunting anymore when you, for instance, compare them to the number that we just saw for fossil fuel imports. We have a big task ahead of us, but it's also an opportunity to fix things. So here we go. The installed generation capacity will need to triple. Yes, this is intimidating, but we can get it done. We have work to do, especially when it comes to renewable generation, with a high share of solar PV in the mix. It's also important to call out the continued need for decarbonized gases that will cover for extended periods of time when other renewable sources are limited. Take a, taking a closer look at the renewable installed capacity, we see the scale of what needs to happen on screen. Solar and offshore wind will increase nine and ten fold, while offshore, onshore wind quadruples. In the graph on screen, we are now moving away from installed capacity and we start to look at dispatch figures. And what stands out here is that even though solar and wind make up the bulk of our decarbonization efforts, we see here that all technologies will need to keep on board to keep our system reliable. Nuclear can provide a stable base load. And together with decarbonized gases can cover for extended periods of time when solar and wind availability are limited. Batteries complement the mix to provide shorter duration flexibility. To make this generation ramp up a reality, we need to invest more than what we have done in the past. Our investments in installed generation capacity will more or less need to double compared to business as usual. And these investments are of course not limited to installed generation capacity. We will also need to invest in our grids because we need to expand, reinforce and modernize our grids in order to deal with increased capacity and also the higher peaks in supply and demand of electricity. And these investments extend to the high voltage space because we will see an increased saturation of the interconnector capacity because of the higher electricity supply and demand in all European countries. Investments in this area will pave the way for a well-connected and robust European energy market. Moving towards a completely decarbonized system requires a lot more flexibility to, co to be incorporated in the system to compared, to what we use co <laughs> sorry, compared to what we have at the moment. And this flexibility can come from a wide array of sources, as is shown on the screen behind me. I started this presentation with a statement that a successful energy transition is not only characterized by CO2 emission reductions. It is also characterized by high standards in efficiency, reliability, and affordability. 
We don't want to get into a situation that we saw last winter, where people are not sure if they can flip the switch and heat their homes. It's about keeping people warm in winter and cool in summer. Therefore, your electric took the results from our modeling and looked at the potential impact on consumer spending. Quality of life by affordability of energy. That is what this is about. So your electric took the results from our modeling and looked at the potential impact of the efficiency gains on end consumer spending, given the investment numbers that we just saw. The ambition is to lower energy costs for households. And the efficiency gains definitely have the potential to do so. The system requires enabling measures, though. This is all a lot to digest. The road ahead is critical, and the pace of change is incredible. We therefore need these enabling measures that are on screen to make the change. For example, we need a strong industrial policy to facilitate the changes that I have presented here today, all the while protecting the competitiveness of the European industry. We also all know that we need more technical skills and training in order to make the transition a reality. A new focus on a new set of skills, which is not easy. We need to work on these elements to make sure that we can break with the trend of the past and accelerate towards a clean energy future. To conclude, a successful energy transition is about CO2 emission reductions, but it is also about efficiency, affordability and reliability. It's about keeping consumers warm in winter and cool in summer. We do not have a choice anymore. We have to act. We need to get this done, and we need to get this right. Thank you for your attention.